Hello everyone, this is Richard from Modern Healthspan. Welcome to the second in our series of interviews with Dr. Michael Lusgarden of Tufts University. Dr. Lusgarden will continue talking about his quantified self experiment. In this video, he will concentrate on the different diets that he has tried and the process of evaluating the results from his biomarkers and then making adjustments to optimize his health. And with that, let me start the interview. So can you just talk about the different diets you've tried and, and kind of which one worked best for you and which one maybe worked worst? Yeah, so I should say diet is still a work in progress, but I feel like, uh, you know, why well, I say I feel like, but it's based on the data. I'm getting to the point that since I've started looking at the multivariate correlations with my biomarkers, I'm going to get to the point where I've got a personalized diet that optimizes my biomarkers. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm on that road now, but it took me five years of having enough data and different trying different things in terms of diet to actually get close to that, which is to me, I think, you know, very interesting to say like, you know, here's what the RDA recommends for, you know, which is not intended for what's optimal. It's intended for basically the minimum to prevent disease. So I'm getting closer to the road. I feel like I'm getting closer to the road of my own true individualized diet that may be optimal for health and disease risk. Uh, lifespan will find out. So I started off uh, going, uh, well, I didn't start off, but uh, I went uh, raw vegan for a full year. And this was probably about five or six years ago. And on that diet, as a, just as a quick review, it um, essentially doubled my triglycerides. So my triglycerides are usually in the triathlete range, 50 to 60. And uh, it basically increased it to 90, which I almost never, you know, over 25 measurements, I've never had them that high. Um, now, granted, it was a, I, I was eating a low fat, um, a low fat uh, vegan diet. So maybe that had something to do with it. Maybe if I tried higher fat, but still vegan, you know, more nuts and seeds and less, uh, you know, complex carbs. So it was highly grain based. So I didn't go that in depth with it. I just um, essentially wasn't eating any meat or fish or dairy. So, but yeah, it doubled my triglycerides and my HDL. Uh, so for whatever reason, I, uh, uh, have to work actually to keep my HDL above 40. Um, even higher than that, I have to really work at it. So my natural tendency is to have lower HDL and HDL less than about 50 um, is not good for aging or cardiovascular disease risk. So uh, on the vegan diet, uh, it reduced my HDL to 28. So once I saw that my tri triglycerides are going in the wrong direction and my HDL was clearly going in the wrong direction. I then added fish back in and I like fish. I'm not a, you know, I, it wasn't hard for me to add it back in. And once I did that, my triglycerides went immediately back to, you know, in the 50 range and HDL went into the, into the forties, or actually I think it went to 35, but still it, it, it was progress towards the right direction. Now, again, I should say, maybe I just didn't do the raw vegan diet best, but, you know, I'd argue that, um, you know, evolutionarily we evolved eating meat and high amounts of vegetables. And there's data to show that I actually have a short blog post showing that uh, paleolithic nutrition was actually, um, you know, on a 3000 calorie diet, there was hundred grams of fiber per day. So pet, you know, paleolithic uh, humans weren't eating not, you know, uh, uh, nothing but meat. It was a lot of uh, animals, but also an abundance of uh, high fibrous, uh, you know, containing vegetables. So once I came across that data, I essentially changed my diet into, you know, almost exclusively vegetable based, but also including fish every day and, uh, you know, occasionally dairy and meat. Uh, so that's pretty similar to the approach that I'm on now. I've played a lot with my fat intake to, to, uh, see where, you know, what optimizes, uh, what, uh, and even within fat intake, fat isn't a homage, uh, you know, homogeneous variable fat includes mono poly, uh, poly and saturated fats. So, you know, I've played around with, um, uh, you know, different saturated fats with things like coconut butter, which I, I love the taste and texture of it, not coconut oil, coconut butter, which is essentially, you know, the meat blended with the coconut water so that it's basically a, a consistency like uh, peanut butter. It tastes amazing for me for whatever reason. So I've played with different levels of that. Um, even I, I, I make my own chocolate. So I have raw cocoa beans in my house. So I grind them with dates. Uh, and so I'm getting that's got saturated fat. So because I've seen some correlations between my saturated fat intake with higher glucose levels, higher creatinine levels, which are going in the wrong direction, but then lower inflammation, lower CRP. So I'm still trying to figure out where my saturated fat, which again comes mostly from plants, should be to optimize all of those variables simultaneously. Um, but then alternatively, there are things like uh, having uh, a higher monounsaturated fat intake 
um, and omega-3 fatty acid intake um, uh, is correlated with uh, one of my uh, red blood cell parameters, the mean corpuscular volume. So in this latest dietary period, I've experimented with increasing, you know, my monounsaturated and uh, omega-3 fats, even though I'm already getting omega-3, some sardines every day, you know, extra flaxseed uh, in my diet to see how it affects the biomarkers. So just in continu continuing that line about diet, you know, so I'll make these changes. So for a given blood test, I'll have a dietary period, you know, so if I test on January 1st, I have a blood test. And then my next blood test is two months later, 60 days, you know, so I have the blood test that corresponds to the 60 day period since my last blood test. So then I take the average dietary intake during that period, which cor correlates with the blood test results for the dietary period. And yeah. then because I have so many blood tests and so many dietary periods, I can see how diet is influencing. So long story short, by, by doing these different dietary tweaks, I can, I can start to see which really, which things really affect my variables and which things don't. The challenge though is what happens in the case where like saturated fat, uh, for example, uh, in my experience, which optimize, potentially optimizes one variable or is correlated with potentially optimizing one variable, CRP, mm. but making two others worse. So it's, for some of these variables, it's finding the, the, the amount that can, you know, minimize, optimize all three. And that may, that may not be possible, so. Right. So what are, you, what are you tweaking in this kind of section? Is, it's the fat, is that right? Yeah, so actually it's more than just the fat. So I, in, for this section, there's more monounsaturated. So I've added uh, pecans and I eat a lot of nuts and seeds, you know, mm -hmm. usually almonds, walnuts, cocoa beans, coconut butter. Um, sesame seeds, I've got a wide variety, but most of them weren't rich in monounsaturated fats, except for almonds. But the reason almonds are rich in monounsaturated fats, but interestingly, almonds are very rich in vitamin E, alpha tocopherol. So I, I have some correlations in my diet between too much dietary vitamin E with worse biomarkers. And almonds would be a significant source of where I'm getting them from. So, uh, you know, it's interesting too, that you would think, oh, if you, you know, if you're getting everything from diet, maybe your biomarkers will be optimal. You know, how can you, how can your diet negatively affect your biomarkers, you know, but maybe there is such a thing as dietary excess, you know, going too high above the RDA and it negatively affecting your biomarkers. So, so more pecans, uh, pecans, however you say it, uh, a, a little bit more flaxseed, a little bit less coconut butter. So less saturated fat. I've actually cut my protein intake by about 10 to 15 grams because that too is correlated with higher glucose levels and uh, worse kidney function for me. So if that's true, I should see changes in those biomarkers uh, with this uh, blood test. Uh, so a little bit less protein. Um, yeah, so that's, and then most important out of all of those could be calorie intake, which kind of goes into the question of calorie restriction. Um, you know, my natural tendency is to eat uh, completely ad lib. I mean, I can easily go, you know, I've got, I've got competitive eater DNA. It's very easy for me to sit and eat thousands of calories and not get full, but that's also to my det detriment. So, uh, with a moderate, you know, amount of some willpower, 2,800 is pretty close to my ad lib intake. So I've been trying to get to 2,500 and for the past uh, year or so, I've been in the 2,500 range, 2,550, somewhere in that range, but for whatever reason, it was just too tough to maintain that. So my calorie intake is actually a little bit higher for the last uh, 60 to 70 days or so in this dietary period. So maybe that extra hundred calories, average hundred calories per day and, uh, increasing my body weight by a pound or two during that period may negatively affect my biomarkers. I don't know. We'll see. Right. Yes. So while we're talking about calorie restriction, so do you, do you fast at all? Do you, do you believe in uh, kind of intermittent fasting or yep. that it will have the same effect? So, uh, yes and no. So, uh, when I hear the idea of uh, uh, fasting, you know, uh, uh, immediately my mind jumps to, oh, I didn't eat for three days. That's a fast. So I, I don't do that at all. So, uh, so I exercise, you know, four times a week, uh, pretty moderate to rigorously. Um, and if I'm not eating for a day, a full day or two days, whatever, it mentally, I don't feel well. I feel weak. Um, I, it, I lose my motivation to lift heavy weights. And I, I like when I do lift I like to lift heavy weights as much as I can while minimizing injury risk, because if I lift too heavy, I may, you know, increase my injury risk, which I have in the past. Um, so I'm trying to be smart about that. But if you said fasting, you know, now kind of going into the time restricted feeding where it's an overnight thing, I'm a big, 
big proponent of that and I actively participate in that. Like yesterday, for example, I finished most of my calories by about one in the afternoon. And then I think I maybe had a hundred calories in between then and by the time I went to bed. So I essentially ate almost nothing from one o'clock PM to, you know, five o'clock in the morning. So that's uh, what a um, 16 hour ish fast. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it's not a classical fast. You know, I always hear people, you know, if I drink coffee, am I breaking my fast? The fact is you're getting almost no calories in coffee. And if, if, if only coffee is what you drink for 24 hours, you're essentially fasting. So if I only eat hundred calories from 1 PM to, you know, five or six in the morning, the next day, for me, that's pretty close to a fast. Um, so I, yeah, I try to eat. Um, and this is a dietary approach too, that based on biomarkers and subjective feel that I've changed based on what may be optimal for me. So I used to literally fast all day, just basically drink green tea in the morning and, uh, not eat all day, get home between five and 6 p.m. and then eat, eat all of my calories, you know, 2,500 or so calories from five to 6 p.m. to nine-ish p.m. every day. And maybe even some days done by seven o'clock. So, you know, it was intermittent fasting and time-restricted feeding. So that led to me waking up a few times during the middle of the night because I eat a lot of vegetables. I've got to use the bathroom in the middle of the night, maybe two, three, four times poor sleep quality. I'd wake up, you know, uh, feeling horrible. And if it was just eventually after, you know, I need to do something different and seeing the time restricted feeding studies, I completely reworked it. So I get most of my calories earlier in the day. Uh, I exercise earlier in the day and, uh, that's helped my sleep immensely. It's helped my subjective feel in the morning immensely. So, um, so, so, so that, yeah. So uh, I, I guess that gets to, uh, all of the question on, uh, you know, intermittent fasting and time restricted feeding, uh, yeah. yeah, now I'm not perfect. I do have days, you know, I'll post my dietary data in various correlations. So, you know, for example, in my deep sleep video, I showed correlations between total calorie intake with uh, my deep sleep and total sleep time. And if you look at the graph, you know, I've got calorie intake and it isn't just up to 3000 or whatever my, you know, a, nor a normal calorie intake would be. Some days I go to 6000, you know, and I'm not, I, I don't do that on purpose. Again, I've suppressed as much as I can my competitive eater DNA but I'm not perfect. Some days I, I just want to eat and I, and I can't stop, but um, I do my best to try to keep it uh, as manageable as, uh, manageable as possible. Right. Some people have, some people have more success with that. I've seen people on CR who can eat 1800 calories a day. I mean, for me, that's, I, I'd have to lose a leg and I'm not even like big, big, huge bodybuilder guy. I'm relatively lean, uh, but uh, I guess I have a faster metabolism. So. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all for watching. And I do hope that you found the video informative. It's very interesting to hear from Dr. Lescarton about his rigorous self-experiment on how he optimizes his biomarkers through monitoring his diet down to the micronutrient level, managing his calorie intake and implementing time-restricted feeding. Dr. Lescarton believes in getting as many of his nutrients from whole foods and is taking minimal supplements to support his well-being. In the next video, he will share his views on supplements and NAD boosters, so please stay tuned. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and will speak to you again soon.